I've been very direct with them that this isn't a piggy bank for them uh, to come when when they feel like it. In my 20 years, uh, it's never been more bullish, if you will, than it is now. The story is was really started off with a supply, you know, dislocation, meaning a structural supply deficit. Japan has been hit by its biggest earthquake since An explosion began. was heard and smoke seen at the power plant. The images of destruction and flooding coming out of Japan are simply heartbreaking. That's why it feels a little bit better, uh, different now in the sense that it, it's much more underpinned. It's uh, There are policy decisions like John referred to that are underpinning these. It's not just targets, it's actual policy decisions that we will be uh, carbon neutral and net zero by, uh, by 2050. And uh, not just the uh, energy transition, you also have the electrification of the transport sector that it, it is starting to add on to the the demand for electricity. So in my 20 years, uh, it's never been more bullish, if you will, than it is now. But the, the sector is obviously going through a bit of a renaissance. And a lot of it is because governments are finally acknowledging uh, that this technology can be a solution to uh, not just climate change, but also energy security and independence. And uh, that's why governments are shifting policy that's why uh, they're throwing financial support. If you have a look at its installed capacity, you can see uh, the largest component right now is coal. Um, and it's, it's, it's really sad that they've now got themselves in this predicament. Um, uh, of having to rely on that gas and coal and, and a lot of that obviously was coming from Russia. It comes back to the question of what happened at the start of the week with the US um, saying they're looking to spend $4.3 billion on enriched uranium. But if you look at the volumes itself, about 100 tonnes a year starting a little bit out in time, you look at that, it's about 2 million pounds uranium uh, a year. And so it, it's not a, a huge amount. I mean, it is an amount, but it will last for a long time. And again, there is a shortage of, of enrichment capacity and conversion capacity. And that enrichment clearly is going to be converted into need for uranium. So it is a higher number than that when it comes to uranium. And if it has to be U.S. mined uranium, well, then that price is, is quite high. And the elephant in the room that everybody's becoming more and more aware of is now, Russia doesn't have much uranium, but they have, do have a lot of enrichment capacity. That's about 40% of the world's enrichment capacity. If that does go away, and some utilities, the Swedish one, for example, have already voluntarily said that we're, we're canceling our contract with the Russians, so we're not taking Russian deliveries, basically self-imposed sanctions. Uh, 
if that were to spread and if there are sanctions in the US, clearly that enrichment is going to have to come from somewhere else. And Urenco, even though they are more or less sold out of enrichment for the time being, they can create it. And this is called the, the overfeeding. But you can basically just use more uranium to free up more of your enrichment capacity. But what that means is that you have to buy uranium in order to produce that enriched product. So the enricher are going to turn into uranium buyers, whereas they have been uranium suppliers to the tune of 20 million pounds a year for the last 10 years. That's all going to switch. Certainly, so they're not going to be no uranium coming to the market from the enrichers. That's 20 million pounds gone. And if they do switch to this overfeeding to create more SWU that the Western world is going to need. So these are very big numbers and that has not had an impact yet. That's coming later this year. You've raised a lot of issues in terms of uh, the susceptibility of supply chains, um, particularly when 40% of all the uranium is coming from one country that all all goes over over uh, Russian soil to get to a Russian port that then has to uh, make its way to the West. In speaking to the Western suppliers of enrichment services, of conversion services, and the uranium itself, uh, they are not too concerned. They say, we can, we can handle this. It certainly won't be at the prices today, but the logistics can be managed. Uh, now, if you have, an, if you're gonna include the Kazakh uranium in this, then in a few years, that is gonna be a problem, absolutely. But I'm also quite confident that the Kazakhs can solve it. No, I'm not aware of anybody that intervened. So, I, you know, we don't, we don't know who that body would be we don't know who has that authority it's a free market i mean every every commodity market has end users and it has speculators and intermediaries you know and so we're we're you know we're on that on the side of the of the financial intermediary and speculator the us has been talking about building a strategic reserve of uranium for about a year now they have a whopping 75 million dollars of funds um to, to acquire uranium. And to my knowledge, they haven't bought a single pound yet because they're incredibly slow moving. I was asked the question, would you ever, um, would you ever loan material out of the trust if, if we were ever in a pinch? And my response was simple. I said, look, I, I'm the fiduciary of the trust. The trust investors have a bullish view on the price of uranium. They made their investments ahead of you and they don't want to loan any material to you. So figure out your own plan. Don't rely on me. I've been very direct with them that this isn't a piggy bank for them uh, to come when when they feel like it. Although there's a lot of complexity around SWU and uranium enrichment, and it's quite a complex constellation of stocks and, and technologies, um, the story is really uh, not enough uranium, and, and, and we need more of it, <laughs> so the price goes up. <laughs>